the things that you're going to do in this place tonight. Now, as all these ladies leave this house, what you're going to do in their homes, Jesus. We speak it in faith, God, and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Amen. Ladies, woo! Welcome to Ladies' Night. I'm so excited for those of you who may not know me. I'm Jennifer Foster, and along with my husband, Jeremy, we get to Pastor Hope City, and I am so excited. I even wore my leather pants. I mean, it is ladies' night. So excited. We have such a wonderful night in store for you guys, and man, I'm just excited. I don't know if you guys know it. You don't know it. A lot of our team knows it, but this whole theme, Fight Like a Girl, has been in my spirit for, man, almost three years. And we kept putting it off. We kept putting it off and saying, no, maybe next year. And it's right on time. It's right on time. Amen. I don't know what you came in here with tonight. I don't know what you are carrying, but I'll promise you this. You will not walk out those doors the same. Amen. Here's, here's what I want you to do. I want every woman in this house, if you're over 30 and if you've been through something and you've overcome it, whether it was external, internal, it can be anything, raise your hand. Raise your hand. I want you to look at the young girl next to you and I want you to tell her you can make it. Amen. And now I want all the young people who didn't raise your hand, I want you to look at somebody and say, you know what, if you're not dead, God's not done. Cause he's not, he's just getting started. And you know what, I wasn't gonna say anything, but I really felt like I should share an experience I had a few months ago. I was talking to a friend of mine about something that I was personally going through. And if I can just be real honest with you guys, I was at a really, really low point. You know where you just get to that point in life where you're like, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. I mean, I'm here again. Here I am going through something again. And it's like, I just don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. I can't see my way out. I mean, my faith is low. And she looked at me and she said, I want you to close your eyes. And I said, okay. And she said, I want you to go back to your biggest struggle. Go back to your biggest struggle. She said, do you have it? And I said, yeah, I know exactly where my biggest struggle was. And she said, okay, I want you to think about all the things that got you through. And I began to think about it. And I began to remember everything that God did in my life. And I remember the faith that welled up inside of me and the strength that came over me. The girls, I don't know where that strength came from. I was a different girl during that time because it was a supernatural strength. And I was drawing so close to God during that time. And can I tell you, like every miracle that I wanted to see come forth came forth during that season. And he did it then. If he could do it then, he can do it again and again and again. So it does not matter what you came in here with tonight. It does not matter what struggles you are going through. Go ahead and give it to God, honey. He wants to take every one of it. He does not want you walking out of here the same tonight. Amen? Amen. Okay. I got to calm down because I'm going to tell you I am not the preacher tonight. I have got a treat for you ladies. I am so excited. I'm gonna introduce someone that I just love very, very dearly. And when we started thinking about this theme, fight like a girl, I'm like, who do I want to preach? Fight like a girl. Like, who does that just, you know, who does, yeah, who's got that fight? And she's definitely not somebody that I would wanna meet up in a dark alley with because I'm gonna tell you, she's fiery. She's like real fiery. She might be little, but yeah, she, she can pack a punch, I'm sure. But uh, you, you know her, you know her husband. We call him the bearded wanderer around here. She's got four beautiful kiddos. She's got a master's degree in counseling. We actually got to hear from her last month during our Love, Sex, and Marriage series, and she brought the fire there, and she's gonna bring the fire tonight. Can you ladies give it up to for my friend, Jackie Groves? to 
be here with you all. You all can have a seat. Man, when she talks about not wanting to see me in a dark alley, my husband says that to me like daily. So, made me smile, but differently. I love it. And I think that the feistiness just comes from the bright orange hair, okay? <laughs> You can't get around it. You can't miss me in a crowd. I've never been worried to take my children into public because I'm like, guys, you can't miss me. Just sh look for a light, shine a flashlight, and I will glow, okay? <laughs> You'll find me, no big deal. But you guys, I, I was already excited to be here, and then I totally lost all my breath in worship, so I'm completely out of breath. And then I see all of you ladies here just so expectant and so excited for what God is gonna do because the very first thing any time I ever start to preach is I say, okay, okay, let's start over. Everybody come expectant. Everybody look for a move of God. But how many ladies do I have in the room tonight that are already ready to see a move of God? How many? Yes. How many of you are excited for a ladies night simply because has anybody noticed that as you get a little bit older, nothing is really ever just for us, just for us ladies? I mean, literally, when I was thinking about it earlier, I was thinking about my time. My time is not mine. I can be ready two hours, three hours, four hours before anything else. And I'm still always late. And I hate to admit it because my husband always says it. And I always just say he's wrong, but my time's not mine. My my sleep's not mine. My bed isn't mine. My sweet children, they invade my bed in the middle of the night. Anybody else? Anybody else who doesn't get that any longer either? My shoes, my shoes are not mine. You all know the Groves, we love our shoes. And um, my daughter, my oldest, she's only 10. So can somebody please tell me why she wears the same shoe size as me? I guess it's because of her dad, but still, it's not fair. It's not okay. My quiet time is rarely just for me, I'm always getting pushed in on that. My toothbrush, <laughs> disgusting, okay? It's not okay. The only exception, the only exception is he's so cute and he's about this tall and he's two and he's bald and he looks just so sweet. And I don't know if he thinks that there's like a lollipop on the end of that thing. I do brush his teeth every day, but he still doesn't seem to know what a toothbrush is. So as soon as I turn around, he jams it in his mouth and rubs on it. And it's gross, it's gross. It's really, really gross, but that's not mine any longer either. And it doesn't seem fair because how many of you would like to feel a little selfish in life, but you know that we really can't be selfish as ladies. It's not something that is possible for us. So nights like tonight, nights like tonight are the exception. This is what we set aside just for you. We are all here to celebrate just you. Tonight, you don't have to take care of anybody, anything. You don't have to worry about anything. All we want you to do is just take care of you. And I'm not saying that to you like I say it to my 12-year-old son. I'm saying in a good way, just take care of you, okay? But some of you might be like, Jackie, I don't even know. I don't even know how to do that any longer. I don't know how to take care of myself. I don't know what I'm supposed to do for me any longer. I've been taking care of everyone else for so, so long, and that's okay. It's okay, because as women, anxieties and stresses and pressures, those things come easy. Amen? Those things come easy. But on nights like tonight, you gotta learn to quiet those, okay? And the first part of that, you guys have already done. You showed up. Good job, ladies, you showed up. I am so proud of you for that. And then the second half of that is the Holy Spirit's job. He will provide everything that you need in this place. But tonight is a night for you to refocus. It's a night for you to refocus, recharge, get the steam that you want. And y'all know we're talking about fighting, so this is gonna be a lot of fun, lots of it. But there is always something to keep us busy. There's always, always. I always used to think that like once we got past this event or past this stage or past this season or past this hump, a big fight, then things would be a little easier or there would be less distractions or we could take a deeper breath. Like, like, I can finally take a deep breath. And then how many of you know it doesn't actually really come if you're just like hoping that it's just gonna come to you naturally? It doesn't because the busy opportunities always come. And in life, 
They just do. Pastor Jennifer, she said, I have four children. It's busy. Y'all have lots of things going on. Life is busy. I cannot take a phone call. No phone calls for me in life. I don't take a phone call. I don't finish sentences. I don't finish meals. Anybody else? All of these things that seem normal to men, they're like, why not? Guys, just hang on a second. I'm going to go talk to somebody. Anybody else? I want to take a phone call. Pastor Jennifer is the only one whose phone calls legitimately that I actually do take because most of the time I'm like, you don't want to hear what's happening over here, guys. Sorry. I love you, though. But other distractions come on assignment. Other distractions are sent to keep you from receiving what God has for you. Because in a moment, in a season, in a valley, God has some confidence and some encouragement and some joy for you always. It's always there. He's always got what we need waiting for us. But the problem a lot of the time is that we get in the way of it because our heads are just a little too noisy. Amen? So tonight, we want you to shut those distractions off. There is a word specifically here for you. And I... I don't want to go any further without first saying thank you big to Pastor Jennifer because she is such a good mother and pastor of this house. And it's, it's her heart and her vision to set up this place and this night with all of the amazing stuff that is outside. I mean, I can't even list it off to you. It's so exciting. We would never, ever think to go do those things for ourselves. And she's like, hey, I want them here so that they can just have fun that they don't usually get to have. So can we give her and our team a big round of applause? And I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share what's in my heart. Because tonight, tonight there is something that we have that we want to communicate to you all as ladies. And that is that we as a team and as a staff, we see you. We see you, ladies. So many times as women, we feel unseen, unappreciated, um, undervalued, invisible in some seasons. And so often it just goes unnoticed. But tonight we want, we just want to start by telling you individually. We want to tell you thank you. You right where you are. If I'm locking eyes with you and I know you, if I'm locking eyes with you and I don't know you, if you are hearing us on the online viewing, wherever you are, I want to say thank you to you. I want to say thank you as a woman for every single time you showed up, for every single time you worked through the pain, for every single time you were unnoticed and you did notice that you were unnoticed, and for every single time that you invested something that you didn't feel you had left, and for every single time that you poured something out that you wished someone would pour back into you, I want to tell you thank you. Because I promise you, as ladies, you don't hear it enough. So I want to start by telling you that we see you. We see you and we value you and we understand your heart as a woman. We may not know every single thing that you're going through, every single thing that you're done, but we see you and we want you to know that you're a big deal. You don't get told that often enough and we know that, but tonight we want you to hear it from us. And tonight... We're going to be talking about fighting like a girl. Yeah. It's a lot more exciting than that. And the reason that it's a lot more exciting than that is because I want to know how many fighters I have in the room. Come on. Okay. Some of y'all got a little too puffed up on that one, so I know you weren't talking about spiritual fighting. Okay. I know. I see you. I told you I saw you, but I really do see you right now. But with that... We have a couple different types of fighters in the room, right? Yeah. Right? We got some different, different ways. We got some scrappers in the room, some of y'all that are maybe fresh out of a physical altercation. I noticed that. <laughs> Those are our scrappers. Then we've also got our verbal ladies. You know who you are? Those of y'all with those sharp tongues. Yikes! And then we have our survivors. How many of our survivors are in the room? That's right. That's right. We got cancer survivors. We have health battle defeaters. We have chronic pain overcomers that never say a word about it. 
We got survivors in this place. Y'all are fighters too. And then we have our intercessors, our ladies of faith that know how to knock down any mountain, not with your fists, but with your knees. We got some fighters in the room, all kinds of fighters. My favorite, I don't think it's my favorite, it's my, it's my husband's favorite fighting story and it's the story he tells continuously because sometimes there's fight in us that we don't really realize is there and it shows up in moments that are not ideal. Anybody ever been there for one of those? Well, when we were first, when we first got married, we didn't have any kids yet. My husband and I have always had a really playful relationship. So we wrestle a lot and tease a lot. And it's the way we survive life. So we just have a lot of fun together. And this one particular trip that we were on, we were in a hotel room and we were, we were goofing off. We were playing around and he had a blanket and we were wrestling. So he was trying to tackle me. And so he has this blanket. Anybody heard this story? I think some of you have. Um, he has this blanket and he goes like aggressively to wrap me up with this blanket. And when he does, he slips and he literally hooks me in the, in the jaw. Okay. So to hear my husband tell this story, it was one of the most frightening moments of his life because he says my eyes went bl blood red and I came at him like, ugh. I don't remember it like that. I remember getting upset. However... His favorite line in that moment is he says, words of affirmation, babe, words of affirmation. <laughs> and he said, I was like, physical touch. I'm like, that never happened. However, I did pull out a fighter in that moment that I had to suppress in that moment because sometimes we all have some fight in us that we may not be quite aware of, that situations can pull it out of us. And tonight, we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk about what kind of fight we have as women, and we're gonna talk about how to use that as a strong, strong woman of God. Because one thing I think we can all agree on is that when we hear the phrase, fight like a girl, they're not saying it nice, are they? No, they're not. They're not like, you ladies are so strong, we wanna fight like you. No, they're not. Like, what do you guys envision? I envision like, like the hands <laughs> and the hair yanking and nails scratching, all that stuff. That's what I envision. But can we just do something tonight? Can we just, can we kind of reclaim it? Like even if it's just in this room, even if it's just in our online viewing, can we reclaim how we fight like a girl? Can we make that not a negative phrase, but can we say, I wanna fight like a girl. I wanna fight like a girl right now. I am a woman of God and I am gonna fight like a girl. So tonight, let's refocus that perspective, okay? All right, I am going to bring us down. We're gonna pray for a second and then we're gonna step into it. Lord, I just thank you right now, Father, that you would move about this room. And Father, I pray you would minister to every single heart and every single woman in the exact way that she needs tonight, Lord. And I pray that you would place the words on my tongue and in my heart that you would like delivered in this place. And I thank you for your fight and for your freedom here. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. 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 All right, so how many of you ladies have heard of the term, the phrase, a one-two combination, a one-two punch, all right? You don't have to be like a crazy MMA follower or incredibly aggress aggressive yourself to know what a one-two punch is. You've probably just heard of it or you've heard of it like the says, like you gave him the old one-two punch. Like it's, it's, a, it's a known phrase, but for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, you're like, wait a minute, like half a punch? Talking about just like, like half one? No, it's a one-two combination. And it's actually a fighting term, it's a boxing term, okay? And it's where the, the person that's throwing punches, they throw two punches in order, like in a consequence, so there's, or in a, in a, what's the word I'm looking for? Sequence, thank you, I knew there was a cuck sound in there. See, I need you. This is good. So they throw them in a rapid, a rapid order. And the reason for that is because it packs more power that way. So what I want you to do, ladies, I want you to just hold tight for a second because I want you to see a visual demonstration of what this actually looks like. So could you join me in welcoming to the stage my friend, the beautiful, brilliant, strong, yummy phrase and her life 
sparring partner, Taz. Awesome. Ew, ew, ew. So Yami, she's amazing. She's an entrepreneur. She is a trainer. She's a coach. She's a model. She's all those things. But she is also, she's a boxer. So she's going to show us what this one-two combination is. And sweet Taz, he's going to just take it. He's going to take it. He's going to take it. Um, and we really, we can't do this alone. So team, could we get like the only way to do boxing? Like, can we get some Rocky music in here, please? Yes. All right. Throw those punches, girl. Show us. Yeah! Come on, give her some support, guys! Even in heels! Yes, one, two, one, two! Awesome, awesome, yes, thank you, guys! Guys, can you give them a round of applause? Exactly! Thank you, guys. So, so simple and obvious. A one-two combination, right? A one-two, one-two, right? So important. But the thing that we want to talk about tonight is I want to introduce you to your one-two combination as women. I want you all to see that how many of you, how many of you know in this life, there's lots to fight over. There's plenty to fight. There's plenty to fight off. There's plenty to fight for. There's plenty to fight against. One of my very favorite scriptures that I will reference probably every single time I speak comes from Jesus in the book of John 16:33 where Jesus said in this world you will have troubles right he's letting us know that in this world there's going to be some fights you're going to be in fights you don't have to be a messy lady you're going to encounter some things that you got to fight for and you got to know how to fight and in that in that tonight maybe you're sitting here like Pastor Jennifer said, maybe you're sitting here and you are currently in the fight of your life. Maybe you would say, yeah, yeah, that's me. I am trying to fight right now. And in the words of Jesus, what follows next in verse 33 is he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And what that means is, it means that we win. But how many of you know, you should have been a lot more excited than that. We win. Yes, yes. But how many of you know that there is a difference between a clear victory and a narrow escape? There's a big difference. And we can win this life. And we can win all the battles we face by a clear victory or a narrow escape. And today, if there's one thing that we can't be as women, it's unarmed cannot be unarmed. As women, we do fight differently. We all fight differently. We all fight differently. I'm feisty with red hair and, and I, I like a Peloton, but you might do it totally different. You might be absolutely fighting in a very, very different way, but the key is that we do it differently than men. And too often, we feel that the only way that we can fight is if we compare it to the way that somebody else's strength looks. And that is not who God has called us to be as women, and it is not not the way that we fight like a woman, the way that God called us to. The problem comes when we don't know just how powerful we are as women of God, as daughters of the Most High God, as daughters of the King. And this is simply because we don't know where our power truly lies. So tonight I want to ask you a question that is, what is your power combination where does your power really lie? I want you to think about yourself as I ask that question. I'm gonna give you some answers, but I want you to apply them to you. I want you to apply them to your journey. I want you to apply them to the battles that you fight. For a boxer, that first punch, I want you to think back to Yami and the way she threw those punches. That first punch you throw in a power combo is the one that sets the tone. It's the one that lays the foundation. That first punch that you throw is the one that says, I'm not scared of you. I won't back down. I won't run and hide. I will stand my ground. That first punch lays the foundation that says, I know my God is bigger. I remember that I win. So I'm not running. So number one in our power combination, the first thing I want you ladies to remember and write this down is the foundational power in our fight as women comes from our ability to believe. 
our ability as women to believe, to trust, to hope, our sensitivity to the heart of God, the way that our faith can rebound after the most traumatic of moments, our ability to believe as women of God. It is an internal purposeful design to not quit. Because no matter how many times, like Pastor Jennifer said, no matter how many times we might come up to the spot where we say, I wanna quit. Everything in me says this isn't worth it. Everything in you says, but you can't quit. Don't you dare quit. That's because that's the way God designed us to be. God designed us with a high capacity to simply trust, to believe in him, and to ultimately champion others. The same way God champions us. And that's why he gave us, each and every one of you, and I am looking at each and every one of you, dependent, independent upon your age or your situation. That's why he gave us all the heart of a mother. He gave us all the heart of a mother because even if you don't have any children whatsoever, he still gave you the ability and the power to believe and to contend for things and for people with passion, with that emotion that God designed inside of us. And I wanna give you an example this morning. We're gonna look, there are two specific, it's not this morning, but this evening, I'm gonna do it now too. Don't worry, I won't make you wait. There are two specific women that are really pivotal in the Bible pertaining to this. And the first one is the Samaritan woman that Jesus met at the well. And the thing that I want y'all to think about, about this woman, is that God revealed himself first to this woman as the Messiah. Now, I don't know if you've really ever thought about it in that sense, but there was not a moment before this moment at the well that he actually admitted, claimed, said outright, I am the Messiah. There were other times in the word that he said that the Son of God made different biblical references that were vague, that were also made about others. But when he came out and said, I am he, I am the Messiah, the very first time he ever did that was with this Samaritan woman at the well. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this woman. This woman, for starters, in that day, whenever they would go and draw water, they would do it, the ladies would do it in groups, and they would do it at the beginning of the day when the sun was the least hot, and they would do it together. And this particular woman, she drew her water at the middle of the day all by herself because this woman's reputation was that of one that nobody wanted to be around. She had many, many sinful, sinful things in her past, and she had had many inappropriate relationships with men. She was what one might call shunned in a whole lot of societies, but definitely in that time. So why then did Jesus choose this woman? Why did he choose this woman to come out for the very first time as I am he? Don't you think that this would be the sort of thing that it would be done in a lobby like ours tonight, like a party? He's like, I'm the Messiah, yeah! And he wants a huge congregation of people to see it and notice it and shout along with him. He didn't. He did it for one messy woman. Why? I believe that he chose this woman because he knew her heart to believe and her heart to hope in something. Because do you know what happened when Jesus said, when she spoke of the Messiah, when she spoke of the coming Christ, and he said, I am he, I am the Messiah. Do you know what she did? She did exactly what he knew she would do. She dropped her jug and she ran and told everybody. She told everybody in the town, I just met a man named Jesus and he said that he is the Messiah, the coming Christ, and I believe him. And you know how I know? Because he told me things in my past that I've never told any of you. He told me things that you guys have never even helped me contempt to. I know that this man, he knows something. And because of it, the entire village knew who the Messiah was and they were all changed by it because of her testimony. He he knew that she would want the others to share in her joy. And I believe he chose a messy woman, ladies, instead of a tidy, well-kept, well-mannered and making all the right choices in life. I believe he chose a messy one because I think he wanted everyone to know that he was the savior for all. He wasn't just the savior for the well-kept ones. He was a savior for all. And he did the very same thing with Mary Magdalene. 
after his resurrection. After his resurrection, Mary Magdalene was the only one that he revealed himself to and said, hey, look, I live. And Mary, very much like the Samaritan woman, had a tricky past. She did not have a background that was incredibly clean and she was not of great reputation either. But what we see is, we can look in the book of John, chapter 20. If you wanna see the story, it's the verses 10 through 18. Jesus had not shown himself to anyone else yet. But after everyone else had left, Mary remained. After everyone else moved on, Mary remained. After everyone else said, I guess it's done. Mary said, it can't be done. This can't be over. Where is he? When she spoke to Jesus for the first time, she actually thought he was the tomb keeper or the gardener or whatever. And she said, please, just, just let me see him. I need, I need to just see him. I need to know. Mary remained. And I believe that that says a lot about what happens when we wait on God. She waited. Ladies, she waited even after everyone else said this is over. It's done. I guess... I guess he's dead now. This thing that we all thought was supposed to be the big thing we were waiting for, it's over and he's dead. And she was not okay with that. She waited. She stayed where she knew he was because she wasn't satisfied until she saw him. How many of us need a little bit more dissatisfaction until we see the things of God present in our lives? How many of us need to stop moving on because it didn't happen right when we wanted it to happen, but God said, wait, wait for it. Hold on, hold out. Sometimes, Just like the Israelites, we give up on the promise too soon because we get impatient with the process. We get impatient with what it looks like. Everyone else had left, ladies, but Mary remained. Now, maybe Jesus would have only revealed himself to her either way. I don't know. But what I do know is that she remained, and she remained still grieving, still desperate, still broken. God wants your brokenness. Girls, you don't have to clean it all up before you bring it to him. God wants you right like you are. And what happened? What happened when she remained? Jesus chose to let her see him before he showed anyone else. And in verse 17, Jesus said to Mary, he said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Did you guys catch that though? So not only did he reveal himself for the first time after his resurrection to a woman, a troubled shame, there's an air quote in there, shame isn't a good word. There's an air quote. I'm sure she felt shame and people wanted her to feel shame. Shame Shame-filled woman. But he also instructed her to carry the message, the gospel, to his 12 chosen men, disciples. Y'all, does that sound like a weak, timid, afraid, unable, incapable, trembling little girl that fights like a girl? No! Jesus saw strength in this woman, just like he sees strength in us because it's what God placed inside of us. The strength of a woman and the power of a woman is uncompromisable, ladies, but we gotta know where that power comes from. We have to be able to understand it. God made us to walk in power because of the trust and the belief in him that he designed within us. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith, not by sight, not by sight. So what does the enemy continuously come for in us though? Our belief, our trust, our confidence, the simplicity of, well, he said it, so I'll wait for it. That's what the enemy wants to come for every single time. So here is what we do. This is how we fight, okay? You stop doubting. 
Ladies, when you receive that first thought of doubt, that's not a sinful thing to feel a thought of doubt, but what do you do next? You start reading the word because the only way we turn around the doubt is to understand what God says that is true and to know what he says that is a promise we can hold on to and to know who he has called us to be. We stop doubting and we start reading what the word of God says about us. We stop fretting. We stop worrying. I love this acronym for fret. It says to have a false sense of responsibility for every little thing, right? Sound about like it? Sound a bit like worry? A false sense of responsibility for every little thing. Stop fretting over every little thing and start casting your cares on God. Because if you start at the beginning of this and you find the doubt and you say, no, I'm gonna get in my word and I'm gonna see what God says I'm supposed to do. And then you come to the fret moments where you're worried and you're concerned and you say, no, the word said I'm supposed to cast my cares on God. I'm not meant to carry this. I might have strong shoulders. I take a lot of pride in having some strong shoulders because I come from somewhere where I had to be strong. But I take a lot of pride in that and these still aren't meant to carry it. They are meant to let it go and cast it on to the the Lord. Stop striving for perfection, ladies. Start being obedient with the simple stuff. Perfection is not something that God ever asked you to be. He gave you Jesus. Stop trying to be perfect. Just be obedient. If he says do it, that means you can. Like you're going to be able to. That's such a simple, simple thing for us, but it's so hard because if God's like, hey, go do that, you're like, hey, hey. (laughs) If God asks you to do it, be obedient in the simplest. Don't let someone tell you that something is too big for God or too big for you. Because last time I checked, God's been parting water since the first page of the Bible in Genesis 1, and he is still holding back the waves from your life today. There is nothing too big for God. There is nothing too supernatural for God. The only thing that's too big for God is what we say is too big for God. What we get in the way of God's power That's the only thing. Don't allow people to tell us what we can trust God for. Because what happens is we stop watching for and expecting the miracles that are happening all around us every single day. Because when you believe it, you won't see them. Mark 9, verses 22 and 23. I love this. I love this passage because I've always had it wrong. I always read this wrong. And let me read it to you. It says, but if you can do anything, this is the story of the man who brought his, his son with an unclean spirit to Jesus, and he's asking Jesus for help. And he says, Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And I always read this passage. You know how sometimes you can read a sentence and your brain like just translates it and you're like, wait a minute, I thought it said, I always thought that was a question mark. I always thought Jesus was saying, if you can, because you know, Jesus always spoke in parables. He was always like, riddle me this, y'all. And so I always thought he was like, if you can, of course I can. Like I'm, I'm Jesus, I'm the Messiah. But he wasn't saying that, it's an exclamation point. He was saying, if you can because anything is possible for him who believes. If you can, he put that back on the man and his own belief. Ladies, our power lies in our belief. People should never have the authority to determine what you believe your God is big enough to handle. Never, never. So belief is the first part, but what about the second? The second punch of a boxer in that one-two combination is the one that brings the heat. It's the support. It's the one that confirms the ability to stand your ground. Number two is the enduring power in our fight as women is found in our relationships. In relationships. The foundation of our strength as women is found in our belief, yes, but the ability to stand comes from relationship. God made us for community, 
Romans 12, 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. He intended for us to pair off. Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, a match, a mate fit for him. He wanted us to have a support system. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Women, relationships like our like primary love language. Like we're surrounded on all sides by love language, by love languages, by relationships. And at the center of almost all of those relationships are us and Jesus. We're right there, whether it's marital, whether it's friendship, whether it's children, whether it's grandparents, whether it's coworkers, we're right there. We are surrounded. And when I say surrounded, I mean literally on all sides. But let me make this very clear here. You were made to be in relationship with others, but defined by relationship with God. You were made, he created you to be in relationships with others, but you were made to be defined and identified and found in and known by your relationship with God. Don't get that twisted, ladies, because there is a massive, massive difference. He wants us to thrive in relationship with others and with him the most more than any of the others. He wants us to know who he says we are more than anybody else. Your relationship with God is the most powerful gift that you have because you have the ability to know personally the one who made you the way you are, the one who knows what's coming out, the one who knows why you do it that way because he made you that way. You have the ability to know him and know him well. The one who spoke purpose into your very existence. The one who moved heaven and earth to give you a future. The one who knew every single hair on your head and when it would start to gray. And I say yours because mine will always be orange. (laughs) But the one who knows the moment that you will start to doubt your capabilities. That's the one. That's the one. The one who saw you weeping in your room hoping nobody would hear you. And nobody would notice. He's the one. No one else has the privilege of knowing you the way that he does. So no one else can speak to who you are like he will when you ask him to. Amen. Again, what's the enemy love to come after? He loves to come after our relationships. He loves to come after our confidence. He loves to come after the roles we play, the roles we don't play, the roles that we want to play, the roles we should play, the roles that we think we should play because she plays that one and we want to play that one. He loves to come after our community and our marriages and our support system. So here's what we do. This is how we fight, ladies. We stop comparing ourselves to someone created in an entirely different way for an entirely different purpose. They have nothing to do with your purpose, nothing whatsoever. The lady to your right and to your left, she's not your competition, she's your champion. Be her champion. Maybe she doesn't admire herself the way you clearly do because you want to be her. Maybe tell her how great she is. Maybe tell her that, man, you're unstoppable. This is amazing. Be a champion, ladies. Start listening to God for what he says is special about you. Stop looking to people to affirm. Affirm the things that they don't know about you. They can't do it. They're going to let you down. It's going to disappoint you because they don't know you like that. They don't know to affirm it. Only God does. The one who put it there. Stop following the poor character, the minimal values, the, the inconsistencies in others, and just start walking in the footprints that Jesus laid out for you in the word with godly people surrounding you to make you better and to pull out the best in you. Set the tone, ladies. Set the pace and set the standard. That's what we're called to do. Would you stand with me, please, ladies? I believe that there are some of you in here this evening and watching online that are standing up against a great fight right there, right here with you. 
Maybe it's a diagnosis in your body. Maybe it's a relationship that's broken. Maybe it's a, something that's troubling your mind. There's no shame in it. Maybe it is a loved one that you're fighting for. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe you've been fighting for a really long time and maybe you're tired. Tonight, I simply want to remind you. I want to remind you that the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's and he's got you. You're not forgotten. It's not too late. It's never too late. You are not alone and you can do this because of the blood of Jesus that covers you. You can do this. There's a miracle working power that's inside of you, at work inside of you. Exodus 14, 14, one of my other absolute favorite scriptures says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Don't quit. I wanna see some of that Mary Magdalene where we remain. Do not quit, he will fight for you. I wanna pray for you tonight, ladies. I wanna pray for you ladies that would say, I'm there, I'm in that battle, I'm in that fight. And anyone that's in that place tonight, with every eye closed, anyone that is in that place, I want you to just lift your hands. I want you to lift your hands before God. You're not lifting your hands to identify yourself to me, you're identifying yourself to the Lord so that he would pour out and overflow into your heart the kind of peace and the kind of joy and the kind of clarity that you need in this moment. Lord Jesus, my prayer for these ladies tonight is Romans 15, 13, that the God of hope would fill them with joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they may abound in hope. And I ask you tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus, that they would feel your tangible presence right now. Right now, Father. Right now, Father, let your peace make them still. Let your peace calm the worry. Let your peace remind them of your promise. Let your peace, let them feel the fight inside of them. Let your comfort wash over them and let them feel hope right now that you're not finished it's not done it's not over and it doesn't matter what they stand facing what is in front of them how big it looks you are a bigger God and you are a miracle working father that will never run out will never quit will never leave and will never abandon especially not his daughter I thank you for that God in the name of Jesus, and with every eye still closed in the room, maybe the relationship that I described to you with a father, with a loving father, with a God who knows you is not something that you're familiar with. Maybe you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life and invited him into your heart. I wanna encourage you tonight that are sitting there saying, I don't know Jesus like that. Ladies, God doesn't need your perfection. That's why he sent Jesus for you for this moment right now so that when you come before him dirty and messy and not liking where you are, not knowing the peace of God or the acceptance of God, that you would come into the arms of a loving father that says, I will cover that. I will cover that with my love because it's what I do. So tonight in this place, I just want to, I want you to know that he wants your belief. He wants your heart. He wants your surrender. Can we all pray that prayer tonight? Father God, repeat it with me. Father God, I come to you tonight. I come to you as a daughter. And I ask you to take me right where I am, right like I am. I ask you to become the Lord of my life to forgive me of my sins and to help me become the fighter that you have called me to be because of the love of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen.